very exciting end of the day. We've made it really far. We have our final speaker of the day, our Zell Lurie Distinguished Speaker, Spencer Levy, um, and our co-chair, Laura Francis. Before we begin, I just want to take one second and say thank you to some of our board members here who have made this day possible. We have in the front row, Delphina, who is our head of operations. And we are so We also have our two head of contents. You've heard from them today. I just want to call them out again, Atessa and Arthi. Really, like, everyone. And now finally, interviewing our guest speaker, we have our other co-chair, Laura. I know you've all heard from her today, but just wanted to give her a quick intro because she is a thought leader in her own right. And it's very exciting to have her doing this here today. Laura has extensive experience in real estate and urban planning. Um, she started a real estate innovation consultancy that developed out-of-the-box real estate concepts from around the world, from a massive food hall in Toronto, to co-living spaces across LA, to placemaking strategies for adaptive reuse projects in the UK and Amsterdam. Also, she developed and exited one of Manhattan's trendiest restaurants, which I'm very excited <laughs> to go to. And she's about to graduate with a master's in city planning. Get back to work at scale. Now to introduce our speaker, Spencer. Just want to give one last shout out. Here, thanks to the generosity of our uh, generous sponsor, the Zellery Center on campus. So uh, if you're a student, I encourage you to go check out some of their other events there. They have a lot of resources that have been very, very helpful as a real estate student on campus. So for Spencer, Spencer is Global Client Strategist and Senior Economic Advisor for CBRE, which, if you don't know, is the largest commercial real estate services firm in the world. He previously served as head of research for CBRE, and today he also serves as co-chair of the Real Estate Roundtable's research committee and is a host of CBRE's podcast, The Weekly Take, which is the most heavily downloaded real estate, commercial real estate podcast on both Apple and Spotify. In fact, very excitingly, he just filmed an episode here with one of our past speakers. So check out that Weekly Take podcast on wherever you listen to uh, podcast. I've always wanted to say that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, thank you both for being here, and I'll let you take it off the floor. Thank you so much, Casey, and thank you to our team as well. Um, I have to say that real estate developers, if you've ever worked with them, are some of the most all-knowing people in the world. <laughs> They decide, I want to build this here, and I expect it to last forever. And that's quite a statement to make. But when they don't know exactly what to do, and they don't really want to admit it, this is the man they call. <laughs> and so uh, we're extremely um, honored and excited to have this conversation with Spencer. Um, he speaks, as part of his role at CBRE, right, he speaks to some of the largest investors, leaseholders, and owners um, in the world. So he has an incredibly unique um, market perspective. So Spencer, to start, if you could just tell us a little bit more about um, what is the state of real estate, what is the state of the world, and um, how's it looking? Well, <laughs> yeah, let's turn the microphone on first here. Right. Here we go. So first of all, I'm just glad I have to make one less shameless plug for the podcast. I want to thank our introductory person. Let me start with the big picture. The real estate market today, when you read the papers, sounds pretty bad. And you hear about people not coming back to the office. You hear about the costs of interest going up for construction loans and every other type of loan. You hear about investors that are waiting for distress to fall. You hear all this negative stuff, and I'm told you heard a lot of this stuff earlier today. Well, give me, let me give you another perspective. All that stuff is true to some degree. But what we also see today is maybe the best buying opportunity I have ever seen in my career. If you're going to buy in areas of central business districts or big cities, which have been depressed. I'll, I'll give you a few numbers just to, you know, I'm not hiding the ball on where these numbers are. 
And I was on with a major foreign investor yesterday, and they're buying a office building in Vancouver, Canada right now at 40% off of where it would have been at peak. And they said, if we're going to buy in San Francisco today, and again, I'm not giving you anything but facts here. They said, we'll buy at 75% off. And they're going to buy in uh, Washington, D.C., it's around 50%. So that's in the office sector. The real estate's a big space. And there's great opportunities in office. I know a lot of people buying there if you're willing to buy without debt. But the other thing we just spoke about, and I just did a podcast with a gentleman who has the uh, modular company. There's such a huge affordable housing shortage out there that if you look at the world through just the prism of the headlines of the papers, say, oh, we can't do real estate because office is hurting. Wrong answer. There's a lot of places where the opportunities right now are excellent. The biggest challenge you're going to have is the cost of capital, the cost and availability of capital. But if you have liquidity, the glass can be half full. And so something that we've talked about is this this cyclical nature of cities, right? That with every opportunity, that means there was a context where opportunity was lost for many. And that when value is potentially created, someone had to lose it. It's kind of like matter, right? You can or energy that you can't create or, um, or lose it. And so when we think about the future of cities um, and this opportunity to take um, advantage of these market conditions, what is the responsibility of those folks, you think, to, to not only just grab these assets, but to push cities forward? What can they do to make their assets not just the, as valuable as 75% off today, but worth 150% tomorrow? So I got into this business in the mid-90s in New York City. And when I got into the business, my company, we bought all kinds of old office buildings in Wall Street. And we bought these buildings at 100 bucks a foot or less. We bought the Woolworth building for 100 bucks. We bought the Daily News building for 110 bucks. We bought buildings in Soho that we bought for less than 100 bucks. And we were hoping to sell out the condos at 300 bucks a foot. Those condos now sell for $4,000 a foot. What can people do? Well... It starts from a very mathematical place where you need to get the basis of your building cheap enough. And then you have the ability to convert it to multifamily or to condos or what most of these buildings are going to do, they're going to stay as office. So if people think that we're converting the whole city, we're not. We're going to be converting what can be converted, uh, but the rest will stay as office. But when people ask me this very question, I say, well, what could you do to make your place the most valuable? Cities don't evolve as cities. Cities evolve as clusters within those cities. So people ask me, well, what city should you invest in? I'm like, well, I don't like any city. I like a lot of submarkets within those cities. So you take Manhattan. When I got into the business, Midtown South was a sleepy little submarket south of Grand Central Station. Nobody went there. Now, who found out about it? Google found out about it. All the tech firms found out about it. And they found out they had the best fiber from Midtown South to uh, New Jersey. And now it's higher than the, the, the uh, broader central business district. But here's the basic point. Find those areas like where we're sitting right now in University City here in Philadelphia, which is the best sub-market in Philadelphia. And it's not a coincidence. Why? We're sitting in Penn and Drexel's right over there. That is the same trend you'll see in most cities. You'll see a couple of trends. You'll see a university as the base. Sometimes you'll see an entertainment base that's increasingly important in the suburbs. So you go to Salt Lake City, you'll see Silicon Slope where they built the whole city around the soccer stadium. And then you'll also see other virtuous cycles within these cities where they have the same characteristics of university, entertainment, live, work, play, and walkability. The most important piece of infrastructure are your own two feet. The second most important piece of infrastructure is a good airport. I think that ultimately, I was just in Rochester, New York, and I was literally there this morning. I had to fly to Newark and take an Uber down here, okay? And I told my friends in Rochester, it's gotta be easier to get there or it's going to be difficult to revive a city that lost Xerox, Kodak, and Bausch and Long. So practical things matter a lot, but these clusters matter most. Absolutely. And um, thinking about, is, is there enough? So we talked a bit about the, the housing crisis and that, the, that there, might not just, there might just not be enough space in this moment for everybody. And, 
and and what do we want to do? We want to build. And so when we're talking about creating more, uh, what what is the path to making that happen? How do we build, and how do we build in a way that isn't just rep- representative of today, but what we need for tomorrow? Well, I would hope that while I'm all for building, and mm-hmm. that's my I'm in the building business, I hope we reuse as much as we can first, because I know a lot of this conference was focused on prop tech, a lot was focused on sustainability tech. The greenest thing you can do is to reuse the existing building and make it greener. I'll give you one statistic. I was on the phone on Tuesday with our global head of sustainability, and I told him I was coming to this conference. I said, well, what do you say about somebody who says, well, we'll just knock it down and build a greener building with better emissions. He's like, well, it's going to take them 30 or 40 years to make up the carbon that they've just created by building the building, by the bricks, by the steel. But what's happening today, there was a famous management guru, his name was Peter Drucker. And he said, if it isn't countable, it doesn't count. And what happens today is it doesn't count that we have embedded carbon in this building. What does count are the emissions. There needs to be a better calculation of the carbon you don't create for the existing structures in order for people not to knock it down and start again because people knock it down and start again look like heroes because of the way we count sustainability. If we counted it with a better card, it would be better. Okay, that's my sustainability soapbox. But how do we move forward with more building? There's enough money, enough innovation, enough tech in the world today. I'm not saying enough. It's always getting better. But you know what there's not enough of? Time. And so when I meet with city officials and government officials, which I do a lot because of the roundtable, I look them in the eye. I say, look, I don't want another tax break. I don't want another opportunity zone. I don't want another place where it's cheaper for me to build. I want my time. And what that means is I want my permitting time to be certain. That is the single most important thing for all developers, is the certainty that if I put this shovel in the ground, I will have the ability to build in six months. And some places have done a good job of it. So we work with a uh, large architectural firm called Gensler. And we think that about 10% of all buildings are potentially convertible from office into multifamily. But said, but some places are doing it better. One place happens to be Calgary, Canada, because they've reduced their permitting time enormously to do that. Another place that's doing it is Florida. Florida came up with this thing called the Live Local Act, which is a big deal. You are able to now convert older buildings if you have a segment that's affordable. And people say, oh, put affordable housing there. Wrong answer. Bow Harbor, which is probably the best mall in the country, is putting affordable housing right smack on that property. Why? Because they need people to work there. So I know this is a real estate and design conference, but I'm just going to cut to the chase. None of us are really in the real estate business. We are in the labor and demographics business. Real estate is a derivative of that. If we can understand where the labor is, how to keep it there, and where people are moving, that's the business we're in. So I want to ask you then, would, why build in Florida if most of it is sinking? Well, that's an uplifting comment. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a Disney World. It's a magical place. The reason why you go to Florida is because of a couple of factors. First of all, 1,200 people a day move to Florida. And they move there because it's got a nice climate. It used to be cheaper, and it still is in some places. Not in Miami, it's not cheap anymore, but there are still some places where it's cheaper. Uh, but, you know, and I'm, this is not to knock higher tax places because taxes are not the devil. But it's an easier place to do business in most places. By the way, Orlando, Tampa are a lot easier to do business in Miami, but it's ease of doing business, no state income taxes, those are great. But now let's get to the elephant sitting in the corner of the room, which you've appropriately pointed out, that it's sinking. So right now, there's a huge transformation that's happening in the commercial real estate space, which is property and casualty insurance, which used to be like this small line item on your balance sheet, is now becoming a massive problem, particularly in Florida, particularly in California. And... People that aren't in those places are seeing their property and casualty insurance costs go by 30% per year. In some places in Florida, California, you're lucky if you can get it. And so it's a great place to live. It's a great place to work. 
but it's getting a lot more expensive because of property and casualty. And I don't even want to get into the whole argument about should we stop carbon emissions, should we be resilient, or should I buy insurance? Those are the three choices you got. Lower emissions, buy insurance, or become more resilient. It's another inefficiency in the market, because the inefficiency in the market is that if you make a more resilient building by doing something like storm shutters, the insurance companies don't care. Insurance companies are all stuck on 100-year floodplains today as they, that's how we measure risk. That's changing, and that's going to make Florida less attractive until it's solved. So how are we going to change that? Uh, in terms of how do we understand uh, climate change and uh, what are the data sources you think that can be most impactful to understanding that for developers? So Gensler, you mentioned, mm -hmm. they sell a lot of their labs around this idea that we have designed so many buildings that we have so much proprietary data that we understand in a unique way how, how people move in these buildings. We understand who wants to be in these buildings more than anyone else. And so when we're collecting data about buildings, about the environment around them, how, how do developers collect that data? What does that look like? And how is it going to help us uh, move these paradigm shifts in the direction that we need them to, not just with the private sector, but also that public sector? Well, there, there's the, the tactical side of it, which is the physical plant, the building itself. And then there's a strategic side of where do I build it, where do I invest, and why? And there are these areas that there's the risk, which is now finally being underwritten correctly, like South Florida, like coastal areas where uh, flood insurance may not be available for long in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. If you want to build a seawall in lower Manhattan, the cost I understand is $100 billion. Who's going to pay for that? On is a good it, day. On a good day. <laughs> is it going to be the people that own the buildings in lower Manhattan, or is it going to be everybody else? So th these are massive questions. But really, it comes down to this. When people ask me where you should build, taking all costs into consideration, you have the short-term investable time horizon, and then you have beyond that. So if you're looking at the short-term investable time horizon, most of our investors are three, five, or 10-year investors, most of them. And if you're looking at a three, five, 10-year basis, I could still make the case for Florida. I could still make the case for Coastal Carolina for housing developments. I could still make the case for California. But if you're looking beyond that, that is a completely different story. And so uh, we do a lot of work measuring not just, there's a company called Yardi, if mm -hmm. you're familiar with Yardi. They did a terrific study, which I will send to anybody in this room who wants it, who breaks down markets by looking not just at the ease of doing business, but their electrical availability, the water availability, the political environment. And that's something you know we could talk about uh, all day if we want to, but I'd prefer to talk about it at a limited fashion. <laughs> Um, those things matter over the long term. So we had on the podcast the other day, I told you I'd have a couple of shameless plugs on the podcast, yeah. <laughs> uh, a terrific demographer. His name is uh, Parag Khan. And you know where he really likes? He likes the Great Lakes. And he likes them because of water. Mm -hmm. And water, he's like, oh, who cares about water? Well, do you know that the average data center uses twenty to 30,000 households worth of water per day? And that's just one type of real estate. And when you realize that water is running out, when you realize that the town next to Scottsdale literally cut off the town next to it from water, and now they have to truck water in there Mad Max style, literally, this is where we're at today. And so when you're thinking about, well, we need data centers close to the customer, well, how are you going to put a data center in Phoenix right now? How are you going to put a data center in Northern Virginia, which is one of the hubs, when they're out of electricity? So when we see our places changing so rapidly in response to technology and the demands that we all create, right? Every time we pull out our phone, every time we put on a Vision Pro headset, every time you know we create this demand, um, what? How? Like, how should real estate react to these technological changes, right? I think there's this interesting tension often between real estate and technology, and that real estate is meant to be designed to um, persevere through decades, if not centuries. But technology is almost often built in with obsolescence. And so where, where should real estate meet technology? Well, in a very practical way. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it one more time. We had an episode <laughs> of the Weekly Day with uh, Laura Pierce Hines, who's the uh, president of Hines. And we talked about CLT, which is cross-laminated timber, which is a building material that you can use in lieu of, 
of steel. And, and what she and her partner on the show said was tenants love these buildings. They literally will walk in the building and touch the wood. They smell the wood. The wood smells good, right? But the problem with CLT is it is not flexible, meaning that once you've built it, you can't just like cut through the slab and put in new wiring. So where real estate needs to meet technology is to have the ability to change and have the ability to change easily into what comes next. Because by the time a U.S. aircraft carrier is built, its technology is already out of date. And it's not that different in real estate. So you need flexibility is the key within those buildings. And, and I think we're learning that lesson. You know, we're taking it on the chin with that lesson right now with office buildings. These buildings are not flexible. Do you know how difficult it is to change a traditional office building, even if it's feasible to do so? And that's before you talk about the regulations for life and safety. So I think flexibility for the long term is the way, it is the pragmatic way real estate folks should look at technology. And um, and in terms of that, like being flexible and learning, I think for me, and I'm sure many in the, in the room, when we talk about those two things, we think of AI, that we have this artificial intelligence source that can learn and learn and learn and then teach us different iterations of what to look like and what to do. And so where do you see these types of technologies? Where do you see the algorithm um, potentially hurting or really propping up um, this movement? I think there's one area where we've, we've come a long way and we're not there yet but we're not hockey sticking anymore. We're no longer at the point of crazy growth. And that's at within the plant prop tech, within the physical four walls of measuring water, measuring electric, having lights that are sensitive to people being there. So that's that's one aspect of technology. I'm not saying we're done yet because I know a big part of today's tech uh, discussion was about that. But the place where we haven't even scratched the surface is the question you asked before. Where should we build? And algorithms are terrible about telling you what to buy and which markets. I know people that were on the show that talked about their algorithms years ago about how oh, we have solved the, the situation about where to buy office buildings. That didn't work out so well. And so I think that's the area where we are still at the very infancy and where I think the greatest opportunity is, is looking strategically, not tactically, at technology where, I, again, we're still improving, but I think with that we're, we're past the hockey stick phase. So if you were entering into ChatGPT, um, the types of questions and the parameters around, this is the type of place I want to build. I want to build a new city here, or I want to build the best sub-market ever. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are some of the, uh, the parameters or the inputs that you would ask um, of, of such a generator? Well, maybe a lot of the things we talked about before but the one that we're not we're dancing around, and I, you know, it is probably the single biggest arbiter of where you should or should not build or can build is the unfortunately the local political environment. It's that is the elephant in the corner of every room of every developer. And I meet with the heads of chambers of commerce. I meet with mayors. I meet with you know other elected officials, and it doesn't always go well because I say that your city is immobile. But capital and labor will go to where it's most productive. And I use the word productive, not efficient, because I think people need to understand the distinction. Productivity is the key. It's doing you know, unlimited amount more with the same amount of resources. Efficiency is just using less resources. We need to find a place that we can be most productive and use our resources most productively. It's much more productive to build a bridge than it is to do you know, some kind of wasteful spending. And where I'm really curious because you know your job takes you to so many places around the world and you're always going in it with a specific lens. Could you tell us a little bit about some maybe some of the recent trips you've taken where you've walked into a place and thought, "Wow, this is what I want to see more of." So, with apologies to my Michigan uh, sweatshirt on today, <laughs> well, I do note that Sam Zell is a Michigan graduate. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give a shout out to the Ohio State University. So see that, I, I, I'm friendly to everybody. So I was in Columbus, Ohio recently, and I'm gonna give you two examples of the future, of what I thought was what should be the future. So one of them is downtown. And the downtown is what's known as their short north, north region, 
which is between their hockey arena where the NHL team plays, and it goes two and a half miles up north to the Ohio State University. Some of the best real estate in America is on that block, but only that block within downtown Columbus. If you can go to a half a mile away to the towers of downtown Columbus, extremely troubled. But that area that has live, work, play, that has the hockey arena, that has the university, that's, I think, a sample that you should you can replicate in the Fulton Market in Chicago, in the Arts District in L.A., Midtown South in Manhattan, right here in University City in Philadelphia. But that's just that's just the urban part of it. The suburban part of it was also in Columbus, which is in a suburb called New Albany, Ohio. And New Albany, Ohio is where they have the new Intel chip plant. And what do they have next to the new Intel chip plant? They have a couple of data centers from, I think, Meta and another one of the big companies. And what do they have next to that? A bunch of multifamily. And what do they have next to that? A bunch of retail. What's my point here? When you see a mega development like that, they're going to need all forms of real estate, especially housing. And you take a look at what Tesla's doing in south of Austin, six million square foot plant. They're building an old fashioned company town there so that they can attract and retain labor. So I think the future of real estate is actually getting smaller in a sense, because I think the way that real estate used to be, it used to be where you had the central business district, you had the shopping district, you had the places where people lived. That still exists, but they're getting closer and closer together from an institutional uh, standpoint of where you want to invest. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Something we had talked about as well is that when you if you've heard of California forever, this new uh, real estate development in the Bay Area, when you look at their investor pitch, it was all about technology, technology. We will have the latest this and all of that. But then when you look at how they market it to the public, it's all about walkability. This idea that you can just use the best form of infrastructure you have, your two feet, to, to go to the grocery store, to go to school, to go to work. Um, and so there there's this interesting tension, I think, then between what we know to be old and true versus what's what's great and new. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about what you think, like for the next five years, 10 years, whatever horizon you think is uh, most helpful, where do you see real estate going with, with technology, data and technology? Sure, so I think that, not dissimilar to my answer before, I think at, at the property level, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're getting there. But what I think, here is where the fundamental shift has, has occurred. As I suggested before, we're not actually in the real estate business, we're in the labor and demographics business. That's where the shift is important because ultimately that's where tenant demand is. And as we were talking from a pure real estate perspective, you look at, well, what do the customers want? The customers want not just a green building. They want to have their Wi-Fi super powerful. And, and if we had more time, I could do a little test on our phones in this room here today, and you could see exactly how powerful it is in this room here today. The truth of the matter is my, my Wi-Fi is generally better at my house than in most offices I go to. And that's that's an example. But but ultimately, the tenants are going to drive. Tenants drove green. I'll give you another statistic. So we used to write what was known as the Green Building Adoption Index. We stopped writing it a couple of years ago, but when we wrote it, we determined that Chicago and D.C. were the two, quote, greenest cities in terms of their office buildings. They were 70% LEED or Energy Star rated. We also determined that multifamily, the greenest city was Denver. The percentage of green buildings in Denver and multifamily, remember I said 70% for? 8%. So even though office buildings, it's becoming, quote, unquote, table stakes there, it's just beginning in housing right now, the whole green revolution, and it's going to be driven by tenants. But but again, this is not to like knock anybody in this room that's you know paying a lot of money in rent. And by the way, the average American now is paying way too much money in rent. Once you pay more than 30% of your take-home pay, you're considered quote-unquote housing poor. By the way, the percentage in California, the average person is 50%. Okay? It's scary how bad the numbers are in affordable housing. But... People need to vote with their feet, not just with their wallets. And because I think right now the marginal renter, and it's not to marginalize them, but the average person would rather pay a dollar less in rent than be in a building that's a dollar more, if it, even if it was a little greener. I think, But that's changed in office. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the tenants will drive the change more than will be 
will the developers will just go to where they can get the best the best return. Do you think there's any technology out there that will help us shift that structurally, not just at the margins? I think a lot of the technology is here today. I think a lot of it is here today at the tactical level. But I think that some of the things that are going to change that are going to be real game changers um, are in some of the mega industries, right? And I think the biggest one is transportation. And transportation, I already said, I think planes are the most important form of transportation other than your own two feet. But I think things like self-driving cars is going to replace the need for new trains. Trains, I used to be a huge train guy. I took the train down here today, right? I'm taking the train home. I love the train. I took the train from Albany to Rochester, from LA to San Diego, from Ann Arbor to Milwaukee, okay? I'm a train guy, but they are extremely expensive and they are immobile. And if the, the only example I will give you is the, the new subway line in San Francisco. That it's cost them how many billions of dollars and nobody's using it. And maybe some of that has to do with return to office, I get that. But what's gonna stop us from self-driving cars? It's the same thing that's stopping us from building the affordable project right across the street. It's regulation. And that's why you're going to see in different countries that have a more of a top-down government approach you're going to see self-driving cars there a lot sooner. And they actually will be at the forefront of green when places like this, where we can't get out of our own way from a permitting standpoint, uh, it's going to hold it back. So I think transportation is the area where you're going to see the biggest difference. Because then if you had something that was green and easy and self-driving, you could live further away. But right now, living closer to the office is the name of the game because people have already voted um, with return to office. They don't like to be I can't wait to see who invents how we suck out all the rubber particular batter from the tires of EVs. <laughs> so that's not what's holding us back. Um, and so I think that that would be, a, I really want to open it up to just a question. I know we're running a little bit over, but I think that your honesty and openness about how you see the world and how you work within it is really interesting. So if anyone has a question or wants to, to react to anything, please, um, Maybe no, we have one in the back there. there. Yes, yes, sir. What's your name? Michael. Nice to meet you. Michael. I was just wondering, because um, your stance on... Oh, thank you. Uh, hey, um, my name is Michael. I was just wondering, um, does your stance on trains and transit-oriented development on trains differ between different types of rail? Because I know you mentioned that um, the Muni in San Francisco, that's a light rail, whereas projects such as Brightline down in Florida... I have a, our primary source of revenue is from the real estate around stations and those trains go faster. So could be argued that they connect Metro era. So I was just wondering, does your stance differ from method of rail? It does. And by the way, I love the bright line. I've been, and listen, as a matter of fact, I've flown all over the world in first class. The bright line is that quality. It is that nice of a train. So it's a, it's a good experience, but it just doesn't have the volume to be meaningful impact to get people to commute from say West Palm beach down to Miami, but it's, it's a good train. But I'm gonna give you another example, and I shouldn't have thrown trains under the bus for former train. <laughs> Not in this room. I had to get that one in there. <laughs> I shouldn't have thrown trains under the bus. I'm gonna give you a, a, an example I consider, a tragic's probably too strong a word, but it's really, really close. So there was, um, this was about five years ago in California, it was known as Prop 50. And what Prop 50 was, was designed to allow you to build affordable housing in the San Francisco Bay Area or throughout the state of California, but along train lines, because that would allow people to live further and further out and commute right back into the city. And what happened? Well, it went over like a Led Zeppelin. It crashed and burned. And it was because everybody in the suburbs said, we don't want that happening out here, which was terrible. So trains very well could be the answer if obvious solutions like building affordable housing next to train lines were easier to do. But because it isn't easy to do, you, you think it's hard to build affordable housing here? Good luck doing it on, you know, out in some of the suburbs here in Philadelphia. Impossible. Until we change that paradigm, I'm not going to be bullish on building more train lines if we can't even use effectively the train lines we have. I'll take one quick question. Maybe There's two more. Yeah. There's two more, one in the back and this gentleman over here. Hi, my name is Castell. Um, my question, you mentioned that legislation, um, politics is one of the greatest barriers to getting some of this work done. 
What do you feel like are some of the solutions to that? Is it more participatory government where citizens understand more about what, what legislation is and isn't being passed and can you know bother and pester some of the um, legislatures a bit more? Or is it um, something different that might help uh, make things faster, make things more efficient? I love this question. and I, I would encourage you to have a Coke with me after this and we'll talk about it at great length because I'll tell you something very macro that I struggle with and I really thought deeply about this, is democracy versus another form of government. This is a geopolitical issue right now. And there are certain countries out there, uh, certain localities, and I, I say this not pejoratively, but just a matter of fact, there's so much democracy that nothing gets done. And uh, this has been a knock on some countries, I'm not gonna name them, that have had too much democracy, nothing's getting done, more authoritarian getting done. So this is what I actually think needs to happen. I consider affordable housing and public schools, which are related, to be the two most important issues in America. And I think if we had a national emergency, something, and again, this is gonna sound anti-democratic, but I'm just gonna say it, that top-down forces people to permit affordable housing in their communities. And so the Department of Transportation, as an example, is doing things like this. They are tying certain funds for new roadways to reducing exclusionary zoning in your area. So that's the, I guess, the stick. The carrot is uh, being able to build build more housing. So I don't have a great answer because I don't think more democracy is the answer. Because I think democracy is as much the problem as it is the solution. The solution is things that will speed up the permitting process. And if it has to be top down, so be it because I think that it's that serious of a problem, and I don't think that it's going to happen from the bottom up. All I heard was a re resounding endorsement of public housing authorities. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say we got to have a coke after this? Talk about that? All right, one more question from the gentleman over here. What's your name? Question. The gentleman with the beard, you, with the glasses? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've heard that developers are hesitant to do a conversion from commercial to residential um, due to the high cost of doing so with the limited returns, um, as well as the regulations that hinder it. Uh, do you have any suggestions for incentives or uh, changes in regulation that could uh, increase the ability for developers to get into this? One word, speed. Give me my time and I will convert that building because the math, IRR and all these other returns for these investors, IRR is ruthless. You move your return out by one year or two years, you could lose 50% or more of your promoted interest, of, of your profit on the deal. If I know that I will get something done in two years versus four, which was a big topic of our podcast today, I see you saying there, Andrew, you will make more money. So there needs to be, the solution is things like, and again, you can agree or disagree with Flores politics, but this one act I am a big supporter of, the Live Local Act, which by law, you have a right to build if you put 20% affordable into some of these buildings and they cut your permitting time by 75% or some huge number. That's the answer. The answer is speed and certainty and building as of right. Well, just before we wrap up, I wanted to take a note from how we wrapped up our first conversation of the day with some incredible leaders. Um, and they shared with us three quick answers. What is an incredible piece of advice that you got about uh, work? What are you currently streaming? And what do you think about that's not work, when you're not working? Sure, uh, incredible piece of advice. And I didn't figure this one out until my mid-40s. Do what you love. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people work hard and like their jobs, but you know they're doing it for the money. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it for the money, because if I didn't have to do this for the money, I would have been a doing something very different. Tell but us. I would, okay, what, 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 the best job I ever had was when I was a lawyer, I was an assistant, assistant district attorney in the domestic violence unit of the Westchester County District Attorney's Office. Best job I ever had. It, you saw stuff there that I can't even describe. I walked home every day feeling I did something good. And I, I like that feeling and I want that again. But I love what I do now and um, so do what you love is the number one. Uh, what am I streaming right now? I, I just watched every series of True Detective, and uh, I love 
that show. Um, so I, I recommend that one. And when I'm not doing work, this is, you know, this one cuts both ways, but I'm just going to be direct with folks. You folks remember that period of time from March through June of 2020 when we were all locked in our houses and there was no professional sports on TV? <laughs> you know what was on TV? Horse racing. Do you know how many horse races I had watched in my life until then? Zero. You know what I watch a lot now? That. And not because of the racing, not because of the gambling. I know the ethical issues. It's because of the statistics. And I'm, an, I'm a research guy. And so the statistics in real estate as compared to horse racing is like the Stone Ages versus the best thing I've ever seen. Horse racing has the best statistics I've ever seen. Why am I talking about this in a real estate conference? <laughs> because there's also hundreds of PhD level articles written about horse racing. And I read a lot of them. And they taught me about real estate because I looked at something completely different. I learned about my industry and what I'll give you just one factoid and we can talk more over drinks in a minute. All the PhD articles said the same thing. They said that the favorite is always materially overbet and the underdog is always materially underbet for psychological reasons. And if you think about real estate that way, what is being materially underbet today? Office. What's being materially overbet? You know, some of the hotter areas of real estate. So again, it's important to have a life outside of real estate and to learn about real estate. <laughs> well, th Spencer, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, like Spencer said, he will be over at happy hour. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. It was a pleasure.